welcome everybody to the Berwick Public Library and to this really fun program on food forests. I'm Rita Cottrell and Dennis Jackson are certified master gardeners who have newly transplanted to the Berwick area from Southern Oregon, where they transformed their six acre property into a beautiful food forest. So tonight, they're going to talk to us about how we can do the same, and you don't need six acres to do it. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you came out. So I have a question. Who uh, in our audience is doing gardening this year? Food, food gardening. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. And has anyone done a food forest? You're working on yours. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I want to say that I was inspired by a neighbor of mine who actually became a really good friend in Oregon. And she has the most remarkable food forest. So she's been my inspiration, and I told her that I was going to mention her tonight, but she has um, transformed her acreage that's just down the hill from where we used to live into this amazing food forest. So a lot of what I've learned has come from hanging out with Terry and watching how she tra has transformed her beautiful property with lots and lots of fruit and, and just so many vegetables. She, she has quite a gift. So, Terry's here with us tonight. So, our, the name of this is Introduction to Food Forest Gardening. So we're probably gonna move through this pretty quickly. We're not gonna cover much of anything in depth because, as you'll find out at the end, we are planning some more classes. So we're gonna go into some different areas in depth in those other classes. So this is just to kind of whet your appetite, get you interested, um, hopefully give you a good basic information about what food forests are and how you can transform your property, no matter what size it is, um, into a food forest that can really sustain and um, give you a lot of food. Got lots of things to talk about there. And first one is what is a food forest? Huh? Any, any ideas? Uh, anybody have any? And just from the name, anybody can even think of what it might be? No? Okay. So, food and forest. So, the, both of them are really important because the food is the product and the forest is sort of like how you do it. Okay. Um, the forest aspect um, we use that word because a forest works through interrelationships. All the plants and animals and insects that are there are all working together, even though they don't really think of themselves as working together. They're just doing their thing, but it all works out that way. So you got um, like the big trees. And then you got smaller trees, and then you got shrubs, and you got ground cover and herbs, and you got uh, the duff or the, the organic matter on top of the soil, and you got the stuff into the soil. So each of those is a distinct layer. Okay? And the different plants and animals and insects all are maybe one of them, maybe they live in one particular layer, maybe they move through the layers, but they're um, the animals and the insects, but they all replying, relying on the plants. And so, like the big canopy provides um, shelter, gives, um, you know, protection from heavy thunderstorms in the, in the summer, gives protection from the sun, um, and, you know, so there's different habitats. There's maybe some places that got full sun and a lot of places that have just partial sun or sun moves through the day. So lots of different microclimates are created be by the layer structure. And then um, on the 
different sized plants. They're like the different insects um, are living with them. Uh, so there's beneficial insects and there's um, ones that you don't really like to have around because they're eating up all your crop. But, you know, if you keep a, the balance with the beneficial insects, then the damage isn't too bad and you can live with it or you can find an easier way of um, keeping them in check instead of like going crazy and running down and getting some herbicide, you know? So, which involves expense and time and, and a certain level of danger, you know? So, um, the forest um, really helps you um, create a sustainable environment because all these elements are working together. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we got, got um, that there's a diverse collection of plants. There's, uh, it's self-sufficient because of that diversity. And it's resilient because of the diversity and uh, um, the richness. So over time, um, there's a higher level of fertility in, in a forest then you know you just go out and make a raised bed and you put some compost in there and you slap a few plants in there you know it's not as resilient as if you've got a whole ecosystem around it okay so here's a picture of a forest who planted that Will somebody till that up and plant those? I don't think so. And does somebody have to go out and maintain that? No. That's the beauty of, of using a forest model for growing your, your food. And as Dennis said, by using a diversity of plants, by utilizing the layers of the forest, you've got the canopy and the the next layer down, and then the shrubs, and the herbaceous layer, and the, the um, ground covers, and the root layer, and the, the mycelial level. So all of these work together to keep things in balance and keep, keep it working, and it, keep it sustainable. So that's what a forest is. And there's a food forest same kind of concept where things are all grown together and it works and it works really well because you're using that model that works in a forest. So I like to think that the very first food forest was the Garden of Eden. I mean it makes sense to me if you believe the Bible story um, and the creation story that Adam and Eve were in this lush garden. To me, that's, that was the first food forest, and many indigenous cultures have continued these practices. Um, it's been lost in a lot of areas just because of progress, and agriculture has changed the way uh, many people have grown their food in more recent years, but still indigenous cultures use the model of the food forest. They will actually go into the forest and plant the things that they want to grow, but they put it into the forest because they know that the forest is going to support the growth. So just like a woodland forest, a food forest, or forest garden, some people call it, uses mainly perennial plants. So. Um, you certainly can use annuals, and we've done that too. So like we have lettuces and, and peas and beans and things. But, but the idea, the ideal in a food forest is that you use mostly perennial plants. And you eat a lot of the things that, um, that our grandparents ate, you know, greens and things that, that people don't, don't eat now, like like sorrel and things like that, that grow in the forested areas. Um, 
are really good sources of food. So you don't have to go to the, the big box store and buy the six packs of everything and put them in, unless that's what you really want. And you can do that in a food forest. But the idea with a food forest is that it becomes self-sustaining. It becomes something that just takes care of itself. And we're going to talk about that. So what are some of the benefits? Because there are many. After World War II, American agriculture shifted gears. Um, and one of the big reasons was that um, heavy equipment was becoming widely available. Because before World War II, it was a depression. And uh, you know, vehicles had just been perfected in the 1910s, right? And uh, so there wasn't heavy equipment really on a farm, and in, except a little bit here and there, and only in the 1930s, hardly anybody could afford it, right? But then war came along, and they started manufacturing all those tanks, and so they learned how to manufacture heavy farm equipment at the same time. And then after the war, they had all this um, chemicals around used to make weapons. Those same chemicals can be used to make fertilizer, commercial fertilizer. And so um, they put those two together and started um, large scale farming the way we've seen it done now. You know, the, the really big tractors, you know, fill up this room, you know, with, with the combines and um, um, satellite controlled leveling of fields, all kinds of fancy stuff. But what they do is they, they rip out all the, there with, and then um, plant a single crop, a monoculture, right? And then if you get a disease, it can wipe out the whole crop. And in fact, if you get a really bad disease, it can wipe out crops out of an entire region because they're all the, like all the soybeans and in several counties all get sick all at the same time. And that's that. And there's hardly any, you know, they don't, they're not actively having any biodiversity. There's a little biodiversity on the edges of their fields, but not much. So by going into a permaculture or food forest, you have all these different plants growing and even if one of them gets sick there's all these other ones that are different types of species and so they don't pick up the disease that like like so you've got a a blight that attacks um, peach trees well maybe your apple tree is going to do fine and your walnut tree is going to do fine um, and then, of course, your lettuce and everything else, they don't care about that. So it's like having, like in fi the financial world, they're always telling you to diversify. So if something bad happens and one of your investments tanks, all your other investments are still intact. So that's the m main thing about monoculture is you're putting all your eggs in one basket and it's a much bigger risk than diversifying with permaculture. So this was a piece of property in, in England. And um, when people moved in, it um, looked like this. And it was, this is actually just right behind the property they bought. And they were able to buy another third of an acre in this field. And then they went to work on it. And this is the same place. But of course, it was a while. It took them 20 years. I mean, you can see the big trees. You know, it wasn't like an overnight thing. But they provided all this diversity. And so they turned this just basically monoculture into a wonderful um, permaculture garden. So one of the other big benefits I'm going to let Dennis talk about this because he's, he's our, climate, our climate change guy, um, is to shorten 
the distance between where the food is grown and where it's consumed. And the cool thing about the food forest is its steps. So you can go out and harvest stuff out of your garden, lettuce, uh, radishes, cucumbers, whatever you want to put in your salad and all of your beautiful herbs. Bring them in the house, wash them, run them through the spinner and put them in a bowl and within, you know, the span of maybe, at most, maybe 20 minutes, right? It's still vibrating because it's so alive. So it takes all of this other stuff out of play. So I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, so like she was just saying, you just jump from here right over to there. But when you go to the store, all these other steps have to happen to get it to you. So, um, you know, sometimes the things come from a long ways away, like that, uh, maybe that coffee and that you really like comes up from Central America or Africa. Um, maybe that chocolate, oh, it's kind of in the same places too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting how those two grow together. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, maybe that banana, oh, no, there's another one, kind of grows in the same place as the coffee and the, and the, and the chocolate, huh? Um, but, yeah, so you, and then, you know, notice how when you go into the supermarket on the outside edge, you got all the fresh food and the dairy and everything, and then you go in the center and you got all that packaging. You got more packaging than you got food. <laughs> so, um, so the food forest, you know, just like a regular garden, um, lets you um, short circuit all that stuff. And the one advantage that the food forest has over just a regular garden is that it can become a self-sustaining system so that as time goes by, you have to put less and less work in it each year to get the same amount of food out of it. A food forest generates way more than just food. And that's, that's one of the great benefits. Um, it encourages biodiversity. I mean, it's based on biodiversity. So uh, biodiversity is, is a big factor. Um, because of the way the food forest is designed and, and continues, it, it stores and retains water. So you don't need to, to use as much water um, because you utilize mulching. And um, all of these things are part of the sort of the formula of food forests. So the other part is that capturing nitrogen and uh, carbon so that it's not going into the air. So the way that you do the fruit forest um, by certain things called like chop and drop and mulching and using plants that have really deep roots like horseradish and comfrey and things like that that bring the minerals and things up to the surface so that the plants can actually utilize them. All of these things help to um, keep the environment healthier because you're not putting all of that into the into the atmosphere. And you're building the soil fertility by um, having it be something that you're not digging up every year. So this is a no-till system where you know you might put a shovel in to plant something in the beginning, but you're not going and digging everything up cutting things off at the surface and leaving the root there to decompose naturally. Attracting and supporting pollinators, that is a big piece of it. Um, and that's done by the types of plants that you, that you plant in the garden. And usually it's, it's, again, it's perennial plants. Perennial meaning they come back every year. Um, and our pollinators are key, of course, we all know that to 
the, the sustainability of our planet and the continuation of plants. I was just saying that we planted some um, uh, elderberries this year, but this is being our first year, you know. It's, <laughs> this is a really young garden. Um, and we don't have a lot of bees yet where we live. In, we're just down the road. Um, they haven't really, haven't really found us, I guess. They're starting to, but. Um, so our elderberries did not get pollinated, and so there won't be any fruit this year. Beautiful plants, but no fruit. So we have to have our pollinators. And as Dennis mentioned, it creates a lot of resilience through this diversity. Resilience is what we really need. That's what's going to keep the garden going. That's what's going to give you really great crops year after year after year. And it uses a lot less resources to maintain it. And we're going to talk about that as we go on. And there's one other benefit that I notice is, is that um, as the, the food forest gets older and more mature and lusher, it's just a great place to hang out. You know? So what's involved in creating a food forest? As we said earlier, the food forest is based on the, the idea of the layers of a woodland forest. So you have all these different plants that are working synergistically together. As Dennis said, they may not even know they're doing that, but it works. Um, and it also helps to maintain the wildlife and support the wildlife, which is a, an important part of our ecosystem. So whether you want the wildlife there or not, I mean, some people don't want the wildlife. They don't want the bunnies and the snakes. And, but in a healthy system, they all can live in harmony. Here's the, the layers of the forest. You've got the, the canopy trees, you know, really big ones, you know, um, oak trees, ash trees. Um, I'm not quite familiar with all the, all the wonderful trees around here just coming from Oregon, but, uh, um, you know, and, and, we, uh, and conifers. Oh, conifers are a great, I really like conifers as part of the canopy w where they belong. And um, because it's like a great winter hangout for animals when, you know, a lot more protection in a conifer in a, in a snowstorm than there is on that oak tree over there. Where's the <laughs> leaves, man? <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, it's with the canopy, you know, layer with 30, 40, 50, 100 foot tall trees. Well, maybe you don't have room for that on your property, but oh, look at that, my neighbor does. That, maybe that can count as part of my canopy layer. Yeah, and the birds don't mind flying from there, flying 50 feet over to this other one. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. So, got your canopy layer. And then the understory, you know, there's like various high shrubs. No, um, not shrubs. They're not shrubs, excuse me. Fruit oh, trees. Fruit it? trees, right, right. Um, so, you know, dwarf, semi-dwarf, or even full-grown, full-size fruit trees, you know, nut trees, like um, English walnuts can be pretty big trees, you know, and maybe not as big as a pine, but um, it could get pretty big. But, um, so, provides this little diversity and, um, and like I said before, the shade and all of that comes on. And then you get down in the shrub layers. Um, so, you know, the, even blackberries and um, various uh, types of berry bushes. Um, and then some non-berry bushes. Let's see, I can't think of any that I know about here, but uh, like in Oregon, there's manzanita. We lived in an oak forest and had manzanita, and it's a wonderful bush. It's a kind of a dry plant, dry um, landscape plant, um, and it could be just like like this big, 
and I've seen them as big as a 20 feet high, but they put out these wonderful pink flowers that like little apple flowers. That's why they call them manzanita, because in Spanish it means manza is apple, and ita is like small. So and there's like these little pink flowers and they just fill up with bees in this early springs, one of the first plants that um, put out flowers and so I'm sure there's probably things around here like similar in nature that the you know, forest has that I just don't know about because <laughs> I just got here <laughs> um, and you got the herbaceous layer and you got all your grasses and you got your like uh, maybe medicinal herbs in there and um, wonderful things that, you know, just like a delight to find hiding in the grass. Well, look at that wonderful flower. You can't hardly see it, but there it is. And then um, there's the ground cover and like some nice things like strawberries and um, little things kind of growing around. And then you got the root layer, you know, you got your onions and your beets if you want to plant that. Maybe you're in the medicinals and you're growing some American ginseng. Maybe uh, there's something else there. Um, oh, um, some of those nice daikon radishes. Mm, I like those. Jerusalem artichokes. Oh, Jerusalem artichokes. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. And then you get the vine layer. In my mind, like the vine layer kind of comes in a little later because you have to get the structure of the forest kind of together to give the vines something to, to cling to. Um, and, and then um, down in the soil, you got all this wonderful fungi doing their things and creating the mycelium network. Um, there's been some really wonderful research during, the, oh, I guess, over, over the last 40 years documenting how plants form relationships with fungi and that the fungi have a much more extensive web through the soil and can bring in nutrients from far away and give it to like a tree in exchange for sugar that the tree makes up in the leaves. So a little marketplace happening down under the ground. Hey man, I'll give you some magnesium for that sugar. <laughs> and um, so they're in um, specific plants get, get into a, a relationship with a certain type of fungi, the, though the fungi aren't like monogamous or something, they'll, they'll get in a relationship with all kinds of different plants. But each, in general, each plant um, likes to be with just one type of fungi. Uh, so that the, there's like a inner penetration of the mycelium into or, or really close approximation of the root. And there's where the exchange is happening. So that's a really important layer and, and, uh, and actually probably one of the foundational layers that kind of give the, the resilience and st um, sustainability to the forest over time. All right. And he also put out those wonderful fruiting bodies that are really tasty to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we talked about the layers now we're going to talk about what plant guilds are. So we know that a guild in, in our everyday life, a guild is a group of people who have some sort of common interest um, and want to work together towards some kind of goal. So in the food forest, we use guilds for the plants. So they're actually um, an area. So, so you're your whole food forest is divided up into areas. These areas are called guilds. And the guilds can have different names. So like a guild is usually centered around a specific type of, usually it's one of the understory plants. So 
a fruit tree or a nut tree. And a lot of people call their guilds by the name of whatever that tree is. So it could be the um, apple tree guild or the peach tree guild. And so that's sort of the, the center, uh, central plant within that guild. But then you have all of these other plants within that guild that form all the layers. And um, as, I, as it says here, that it's, it uh, also can include all animals and the fungi and the insects. And they all work together. They just seem to know. They do their job. And each of those has a really important function. So those functions all seem to work together to keep the guild really, really healthy. And instead of thinking about specific plants, it's good to think about what function a plant is going to serve. And we're going to talk about that. Here are the various plant functions that plants can be divided into. And the beauty of this is that plants can serve more than one function. So we have, um, I'll go through these real quickly, um, the attractor. So the attractor are basically our pollinator plants. Those are the plants that say, come on, come on, come over here. We've got some squash that need to be pollinated or some, some elderberries that need to be pollinated. So if you put attractor plants near where your, your things are blooming, and you have to make sure that your pollinator plant blooms at the same time as your fruiting plant so that they can actually bring the bugs in at the right time. So there's a lot of planning and timing that goes into um, setting up a food forest. The confuser, I love this one. These are things that repel things. So we, we know, what's, what's a confuser that you might think of in your own garden? What do you... Exactly, marigolds. Marigolds are a great one. Onions are another one. Um, things don't like to be around those. Uh, bugs, mostly bugs. So they confuse the plant and, and draw them away from the plant. Uh, suppressors. Suppressors are things that are used um, when you want to keep vegetation down. So things like um, ground covers, uh, mostly ground covers would be in the suppressor. So it would keep the weeds down. So clover, things like that, that you would plant as an understory underneath all your other plants. And mulchers. Mulchers are things like, um, well, one that I can think of that's really good is comfrey. And and with comfrey, we utilize a technique called chop and drop. So instead of pulling a plant up, you go over to the plant, and, and you know how to do this with if you've ever grown comfrey. You cut the plant down, and you lay it down on the ground, and you let it go back to the earth. So it actually creates a mulch and a food for the ground underneath the plants. So fixers, fixers are things like, um, usually like legumes, so beans and peas and things like that, fix the nitrogen in the soil. So they bring the nitrogen so it's usable for the plant. So it's good to plant things like that near plants that need a lot of nitrogen. Feeders, feeders are things that, that feed the plants and also feed us. So I, I consider our vegetables that we eat in the feeder category. And accumulators, accumulators are things that draw up um, the um, minerals from deep in the earth. So like horseradish, things like that that have really deep roots, really deep tap roots, those are fixers. Or sorry, accumulators, my mistake. So when you're building those, planning those guilds, you want to think about all these different jobs. And I have lists and lists of things that tell what 
plants do what jobs. There are lots of databases. I, I like this, um, this quote from Frank Lloyd Wright, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature, because nature never fails. So, how much food do you think we can grow in a food forest? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Because you're layering. And so you've always got things that are coming on. Food's always coming on. You don't, I mean, you still have big harvest times, but you're eating all the time from the food forest. So I liked this picture. I don't know exactly where this food forest is, but you see this tiny little lot, little city lot, and there's a food forest in it. And you can see how much is jam-packed into that small little area. They are wild. They look wilder. They're not straight little rows, you know, with little fences around them, like Martha Stewart kind of gardens. But, um, you know, she can have her garden. But I like this. I think this is closer to nature. It's a lot more sustainable, that's for sure. So, here's some actual statistics from the Urban Homestead. Oh, I see I made a typo there um, at the end. It's org, not org, org. <laughs> <laughs> so, one-tenth of an acre of land, which is basically what we have here in Berwick. One-tenth of an acre. That's pretty small. This is what you can grow on it. 350 different species of plants. Now, this is, this is a mature garden, forest garden. So this is probably three years to five years because, you know, your fruit trees have to grow up enough that you're going to get the volume. Although I have to say that we planted semi-dwarf um, trees this spring, well, two months ago. And I just took 42 little peaches off of that tree. It's first year. And the other tree, I think it was like 24. But so it doesn't take too long if you have really good stock. That's one of the things is you want to get really good quality stock. So you can get 6,000 pounds of harvest out of a tenth of an acre. Now that's everything. That's, you know, that's your roots, that's, your, that's all of the lettuce and, and your, your herbs and all those kind of things. So that's everything. But, you know, if you happen to be a vegetarian and you can plant the things that you really love, you're pretty self-sustaining. talk about that. Okay. So one of the, probably one of the most important things to consider is what is your objective? So food forest, you know, the food, there's like the full-fledged food forest that's uh, self-sustaining and all of that. But one's got to consider like, oh, I got this pesky little thing called a job or something, you know, and I got to be gone a long part of the day. So maybe you don't opt for a full-on complete food forest, but you take um, several of the principles and work it into your own gardening. So, um, you know, so you can work towards maybe having a full-on food forest even if you've got a full-time job but you know just like you can with doing a garden but you know just each year maybe change things up a little bit at a time and finally get there um, but you know you got to consider what's what's on your property what what can you, you can do you um, you got uh, like we only got a tenth of an acre, that, and so there's plenty of room there to get going, but some people actually even have less. <laughs> some people have way more. Uh, so just balancing all that, and, um, figuring you know, how much effort, what's your level of effort that you're gonna put in, and um, 
you know, what do you want to get out of it? Do you want to just um, have something you can um, do by yourself, or do you want to bring in all of your family and have a good um, educational thing? Bring your neighbors in, get everybody all excited and uh, and share, and then um, you know. So that's really all up to you. That's we just tell you that's the ideas that you can go with. What's your motivation? Yes. So harvest time. It's just some juicy pictures to get you excited about the possibilities. These are not out of reach by any stretch of the imagination. So beautiful. And then, of course, you, you want to extend it, right? Because once you harvest all that, you can't possibly eat it all at one time. So then you want to look at how you're going to extend it. So good root cellar or create some sort of a root cellar type thing in your basement. Um, get yourself a dehydrator, um, a good freezer, and, and those, those vacuum bags work really well for a lot of things. And learning how to do canning and fermenting. I didn't have a picture of fermenting here, but we do a lot of fermenting foods. And um, it's a great way to preserve food longer. And plus it's really, really healthy for your, your uh, microbiome. So how much work is it to do all that? That's a biggie, right? How much time? So this is again from Urban Homestead. At first I thought, ah, oh, this is no way, this is true. But um, once the food forest becomes mature, that's the whole idea is that you want it to become self-maintaining. And that's why we plant perennials. So that you're not, you don't have to go in and till it up every year. You know, you don't. You don't have that whole big piece of it. You don't have to do weeding because you're setting it up in a way where you're using mulches and things to, and not only quote unquote dead mulches, but also living mulches so that it keeps the weeds at bay. Um, but this says that once a food forest the size of a football field, which we said was what? 1.3 acres. 1.3 acres. Once it's installed and it's mature, three to five years, it can feed 30 to 40 people for a year with one person maintaining it. Now, I don't know how much time that one person is putting in. And I'm not sure exactly what maintaining means. Is that harvesting? I don't think so. I think maintaining is just the, the, the regular maintenance, because harvesting that much food is a lot, a lot, takes a lot of time. But that's based on 2,000 pounds per person per year. That's the average that you can get from, and that's what we're hoping we'll be able to do. So um, there's this, this guy in Canada, Keith St. John, and he is one of my permaculture gurus. He's this young guy, he's in his 40s. Um, he was an, uh, a mechanical engineer, very successful, a very successful job. And about five years ago, he, um, he was done. He said, I, I'm stepping out of this rat race. And he and his family bought some acreage in Ontario. And he started learning about permaculture and food foresting. <coughs> And he, he is marvelous to watch. He has a whole YouTube channel, and, and I have learned so much from him. He's a brilliant guy. And today I was just trying to find a picture uh, that would exemplify what he said about, um, so how much work do you have to do to maintain it? And he did a, practically a whole video. He said, okay, so I'm going to have you walk around with me and, and see what it takes to maintain the garden. And he goes over and sits down. And the rest of the video, he's just sitting there. 
So um, that may be a bit of overkill, but basically that's the goal. If you set it up right and you plan it right, there's, there's lots. And that's why we're going to do other classes, because there's a lot to learn. Um, but it's not hard. It's just you have to sort of follow the rules, follow what works. Um, it doesn't take a lot to maintain it after it's in and mature. I just thought that was a great picture. I loved it. Okay, and how is it possible? Like I just said, planning. Planning's a big part of it. We're going to show you in a minute what we did. Um, commitment. It takes commitment to get up and go out there and do the work. But once you start seeing, I mean, we've only been two months. You're going to see what's happened in two months. Within the first few weeks, we already started seeing things that were happening that was like, wow, look at that. It's just been a few weeks. So, and the diversity. Diversity is really important. So, you, you know, you have to have a lot of different kinds of plants. And, and it's, gardening is not an exact science. And as if you know, if you're a gardener, that you have this idea, oh, I'm going to put this plant here. It's just the perfect place for this plant. And then next year you go, that plant doesn't belong here. And you move it, right? You move it to a better spot. So um, having a plan is good and, you know, being willing to say, oh, maybe I didn't put that in the right place, or I didn't plant it correctly. We had that happen. And resilience. So where do you start? <coughs> I'm conscious of the time, so we'll just zip through these pretty fast. Um, the main thing is, you, if you have an idea of where you want your food forest to be, go to that place sit down and observe. Look around, see, see what's there, what's in the surrounding area. Are there already plants there? Is there nothing there? Um, is there a creek that runs through it? Uh, is there a playground next to it? Is there a factory next to it? Is there a big road? Um, listen, that's, that's another thing is to listen. Listen to the birds because they're a big part of what you're going to create a habitat for. Be curious. I love the word curious. I just think that we need to have more curiosity in our lives. We'd learn so much more if we were more curious. Ask questions. Wonder. Wonder. Hmm, I wonder what would happen if I did that. So you want to look at the characteristics of the of the space and be curious. What, what, what would it look like if I had, you know, peach trees along there or hazelnut trees? Or and then you want to analyze it. How would this space meet that, those goals that you have? So like if your goal was to make money at it, you know, a tenth of an acre probably isn't the property. But it might be depending on what you would, what you would want to focus on. So you want to make sure that your space is going to support your goal or your goals. There may be more than one. And then you want to create a design. And you want to be flexible with the design. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead here real quick. So where we began, this was the property in November when I looked at it. Dennis was still in Oregon trying to sell our property there. And um, my realtor, we had looked at a number of different places, the realtor and I, and she said, you know, there's this little condo over on Goodwin Street. And I'm like, condo? We're country people. <laughs> but I said, okay, well, I'll look at it. We drove in, and there was the mother tree. And the blank slate. I mean, 
the prop the house is nice the condo is nice but that mother tree is what spoke to me and she said I could help you so I listened right and I was curious I thought help me oh food forest oh look at that blank slate we could just create whatever we want whatever we want from that okay so I spent Jan January, we spent January and February, maybe part of March, and dreamed big. And I try to make things fun, you know, so I got out my colored paper and I cut trees and cut a pond and, and I laid it out. And all of a sudden, it kind of became real. Like, oh, look at what we could do with this. So we sat with it. We spent a lot of hours on the computer. Dennis is really good on the computer and laying it all out, which we did. We laid it out on the computer, did a lot of measuring. Nicole was there helping us do some of the measuring. So we refined the vision a little bit. And since then, we've refined it a lot. So, here we are. There's Nicole right there. Right there. And her son. So, Dennis, Dennis is kind of the science guy. So, you know, he, he had to measure everything, and, which really helped. He laid out, basically laid out a grid. So, we knew where we could place things. Because especially with a small piece of property, and we're putting in 10 fruit trees, you know, we had to measure to make sure that our canopies were not going to go crashing into each other. So it was really important and it really helped a lot. And we actually still have, have the grid laid out even though we have it planted. And then we had, uh, we had a few days, actually I think it was just one week when kids were on the break, I think it was, in April. And we had 15 people come over and help dig, dig holes for the trees. And it was fun. We had a lot of fun. So transformation started happening. This is along that fence in the front. Oh, I was standing inside the fence. That didn't help at all. Sorry. Um, anyway, there wasn't anything there except landscape cloth, which I do not like. Landscape cloth and red bark mulch. So, um, so this is our, what we call our blueberry guild. So some, some folks came over and helped us um, take all of this off and we saved it all. We put it all in tubs because in a condo, you know, things have to be kind of uniform. So they, the previous people had decided on that color mulch. So in the front, we use that color mulch. So we took that all out, and here are blueberry bushes. And then I started adding to it and adding in herbs, and these are lettuce plants, and um, lupins, and columbine, and there's almost every function is in here. And, this, and you can see that was April 20th, and this is the 8th of June. So it's pretty amazing what can happen in a short period of time. And so from that to this in 60 days. So I took this picture yesterday. So in this, and this is, a, so this is a guild. This is what we call a guild. And in this guild, we have, you can't really see them very well because they're not that big yet. There's a fruit tree here, a fruit tree here, and a fruit tree here. And there's a shrub here, the only shrub we have in there yet. But back here we have fruit trees and there are some shrubs in here. But we have almost every layer except in, in here. Actually, I don't have any vines. There's no vines in there yet because we don't have the structure for vines. Although, over here in this guild, which you can't really see, I'm making, a, I'm making my own 
structure. I'm doing a teepee for beans. So that's your vine. But this has almost every one of the layers in it, even though it's small and it's young and early. And there are a lot of perennials in here, but there are also are, you know, a lot of annuals. There's like, this is all kale, and I have a row of iris here, so that's perennials. And then the pollinator plants all are mostly grouped together. So that's what can happen in 60 days. What is that measure? Like how long is that? So those are about, um, I think this one's a... Why is point the longest point? Oh, well, yeah. this is about 350 square feet. Uh, so see, it's about, um, I think, 16 um, to 20 feet. I forgot the, the measurements yeah, on something it. Something like that. I think this one back here is like 450 square feet. Yeah. And here's the first fruits in two months. So I don't have any ripe strawberries to show you because we have a taste tester. We have a little chipmunk, and he's decided that uh, along that one area, I have lots of strawberries planted, but that one area along that fence that has strawberries all along the front of it, it's just the perfect place for him to zip in and underneath nobody sees him. And he just goes, mmm, good. <laughs> one bite out of every strawberry. So I told him, I said, okay, you can have those strawberries, but the other ones, you, no. Here's a tiny little cherry on our Romeo cherry tree. And look at the blueberries. We have 12 blueberry bushes, I think. So they'll be pretty soon. We're not supposed to eat those the first year, but we're going to. And a service berry. I, I just am totally in love with service berries. And I left one peach on the tree, and that's what that is. <laughs> Except that I took it from that angle because it's pretty. The other side, the bird already got it. <laughs> But it's pretty amazing that we've already got fruit. So let's review real quick, because I want to leave it open for, for questions. I'm just going to read these. Uh, what's a food forest? A low maintenance, regenerative, and sustainable gardening practice that resembles woodland forest layers, where each plant serves a synergistic function in creating a resilient, and diverse environment that supports pollinators. Okay, by building soil fertility, a food forest gathers and stores water, sequesters carbon, nitrogen, and requires less fossil fuels to provide a garden to table harvest of organically grown food. That's What's involved in designing and growing food forest. Guilds allow a diverse selection of plants, known as polyculture, to share growing space utilizing layering and thereby creating a more resilient growing environment than the typical monoculture farming model. And how much food can I grow in a food forest? Food forests naturally create resilience through a diversity of Primarily perennial plants, which ensure a greater harvest of fruits, nuts, berries, vegetables, herbs, roots, and tubers, and edible greens, fungi, and medicinals with minimal maintenance. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> so isn't it a lot of work to grow a food forest? Food forests require time to analyze the location, determine a plant list, prepare the soil, and plant and mulch into gills. It takes a commitment to the long-term sustainability and success of the garden. Maintenance after the first couple of years is minimal compared to conventional gardening methods. Because you're not out there tilling and starting all over every year. So where do I start? By knowing your motivation for growing a food forest and understanding your time and financial resources, as well as the attributes of your property. 
You can begin to envision a food forest plan for your space that is inspired by the types of plants that you are interested in growing. And there are a lot of options. So, thank you. Any questions? One thing I didn't, let me go back here, sorry. We skipped over a little bit there. Um, I just wanted to mention that, doo, 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 that we are gonna do some other classes because there's just so much to learn. We're still learning, you know. Let me tell you one of the things that we learned this year. Of course, we really pushed the envelope. We moved in in December, late December, right? And started doing the planning. We broke ground, so to speak, um, in April, late April. And the way you do with, with food forest is you don't dig into the ground and disturb the ground. I mean, you do have to do some, but um, minimal, because there's all this life in there. So like when you get out there with a rototiller, all the worms and all the mycelium and everything, you know, get disturbed. And that's what starts the downfall. So we put down cardboard, sheets of cardboard, lots of cardboard, but lots of cardboard. <laughs> and then um, mulch over top of it. So in Oregon, when we did it, we started in the fall one year and put, put down the cardboard. And then we had time to do a lasagna method, which we'll talk about in future classes, a lasagna method where you add um, manure and leaves and compost and all on top of that in the fall. And of course, it's different in Oregon because we don't have the freezes like you have here. But in the fall, put that down and throughout the winter and all the rain, then it starts to decompose. Well, we didn't have that time. So we get the cardboard down and the mulch on it. And, you know, the mulch was in the first, our first guild was probably that deep. And so I get out there and I start putting in kale and spinach and bok choy and stuff like that. Get them all in, get them all watered. They look good for a couple weeks. Then they started turning all yellow and I'm like, what? What's going on? Finally, we realized the cardboard hadn't had time to decompose, so it was acting as uh, a barrier so the water was just so all the plants were like you know in the water so these are the kinds of things that happen you know you do something you think you're doing the right thing and then you realize oh that wasn't so good so it's really better to start this process now planning for next year so that's why we're going to start doing some classes so these are what we thought would be good classes to follow up on this introductory. So designing the food forest thoughts into reality. So we'd like to do a whole thing on, whole class on designing, which will probably include some homework, I hope. What plants where? So that's the function, those functions that we talked about, form and function. Building your soil. How, why, how, and when. So that's a big one. So we'd like, we might even move that one up because you can start building soil before you even start or as you're doing the designing. And then pl planting for pollination because, you know, without them, why bother? You know, you end up with elderberry plants that didn't get pollinated. They're pretty little plants, but you know, you, I want elderberries. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's something to think about, and we're, we're talking about when those classes might be, so we'll keep you in the loop on that. And there's another section we didn't go through about these questions, but they're all on your sheets, and um, I did those sheets so that you could take notes and even questions, write questions out. So, um, okay, any questions?
Yes. You mentioned your taste tester. Yeah. You share your harvest with the squirrels, chipmunks, rabbits, skunks, possums, and birds we get around here. Woodchucks. We will. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that we're on our property because it's all fenced. Um, we do have a bunny because we saw uh, we saw the the footprints in the snow, so we know there is a rabbit around. There is a cat or two cats maybe that go through. Um, yeah, we're committed to taking care of the animals too. So we were very committed in Oregon, and and many amazing animals came to live on our property. Foxes and, um, well, we had a family of about 13 deer that lived on the property, pretty much. Um, we had lots, including bear and various other things that would come through, but um, we just, that's just our commitment, because we're not into killing things. So I see two challenges with me, and me in particular. First is, I don't have the knowledge about plants. Mm -hmm. And it seems you really have to know, like you were saying, Dennis, how, how much it grows, how wide. You know, you really have to have a little bit more knowledge than I do, or the commitment to find it out. Mm -hmm. And the other challenge is our growing season. Mm -hmm. So how would you recommend to someone that wants to do this in Maine, where, did, where would you, I know you, you gave us good starting generally, but. Uh, That's a very good question and we're learning as well. Yeah. I realize that things are, the time is really compressed into just yeah. a few months. It's very different than where we were. in. In Oregon, we were in zone 8B, here it's 5B. So many plants there were perennials that here are annuals. So yeah, it is different. Um, and there's lots of resources, lots of databases, and, and I've availed myself of a lot of those things to, to learn because I'm having to learn. It's because it's so different, so. And, you know, we hope to be able to share some of that with people as well. Because, yeah, it's a lot of information. And it's still trial and error. You know, you just have to be flexible and know that you're going to make some mistakes. Do you know of any people that have successful food forests in this state? Like, I don't know if you... Do you have guilds of your own that you... Well, there, uh, there are, yes, there is a Seacoast Permaculture Group here, and I just reached out to them recently. So, um, but I, honestly, I, I've been so busy with, between my mother and all these other things that I, I have not reached out a lot to, um, to find other. I, I am on several Facebook gardening groups, but... Um, they're doing conventional gardening yeah. for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Tried and true, so, you know, what, what their grandparents did. So, so we're learning. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? Anybody interested in coming to the other classes? Do you, you must prune your food trees. <laughs> yes, fruit trees need to be pruned. Um, we have not because this is our first year with them. So, but next year we will prune them. Um, we also have had uh, a blight issue already. We've lost two trees to different things, which is interesting. Um, so we're learning. It's like, what's wrong with that tree? Oh, fire blight. Yeah, so you just have to be okay. That's why we do diversity. If you have the diversity, if you lose one thing, 
you know, it's not the end of the world because you have all this other stuff. So. I think Larry's probably glad I'm here, and he's not here, my husband, because I can imagine when I start dreaming of what I'll plant, and digging holes all over the house. But I don't have the time right now, but someday I will. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to start the dreaming now then. Start the planning now. You'll have plenty of time to find out how big things get. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's true. You're right. It's I true. did plant two crab apples because, mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of birds and mm -hmm. I feed the birds and I have a lot of wildlife and we live on the edge mm -hmm. of woods and forest. And we lost a whole lot of very tall pines in a bad storm. Mm. Uh, over the course of a couple of years, um, two different bad storms. I lost 13 trees wow. in my property, and I love mm. the trees, Oof. but they're very shallow root system. Yep. So I wanted beautiful trees that weren't going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I planted so that's a good motivator. crab apples for the birds mm -hmm. and the deer and all. all right. So I feel like I've started my mm -hmm. Forest. Yeah. What do we call it? Food forest? Your food forest. Yeah. 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 you you've got you've got and some of that understory and blueberries. And I put so, blueberries right near that. So you're you're you've already started it. Yeah. You've already got a guild going. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. You're welcome. And I want to say that please Come over and look. We're just, we're right on Goodwin Street, just right off of Sullivan. So you know, our contact information is on that sheet. Um, call us and come over and, and just walk around. Maybe you'll give us some advice. Have you written a book yet? Have I written a book? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're just this starting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm a great researcher. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.